All right, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Market Disruptor Show. Today, I am joined by Harry Dent, someone I'm super excited to uh, talk to, somebody I've been following for, shoot, now uh, almost 15 years, and I love his work, and so I'm, I'm excited to talk to him. Uh, so, Harry, welcome, and thanks for coming on. Yeah, nice to be here, Mark. So, um, obviously, like I said, I've been following you for like 15 years. I've read all your books, watched all your videos, uh, but not everybody knows who you are. So maybe just kind of give us a quick background on, on uh, what you've been doing, what your experience is, and, and kind of what you're working on. Yeah, yeah. I kind of call myself first a rogue economist and an accidental economist. I studied business. I took economics for a few courses as a major, then gave up. I just thought it was useless and really didn't apply to much. And so I took all types of business stuff and went to Harvard Business School and then consulted the Fortune 100 companies at Bain and Company. But I tell you, the big change in my career, I took a turnaround for a company, and a publishing company in California and just got into the whole small business entrepreneurial arena where you're seeing people creating the future rather than Fortune 100. They're always managing the path of older generations of customers. So I discovered the baby boom, which my new clients were appealing to when they were young, just entering the workforce and starting new trends. And so I studied the baby boom and I said, whoa, people have no idea what's coming at the economy. This is a massive generation of people and they're also very innovative and then they're, they're change makers. And so I started studying demographics and cycles and all types of stuff for my clients. And by the late 80s, this was in the early 80s, and by the late 80s, I had a whole basic new set of macroeconomic indicators that just came out of my own research and experience and, and worked really, really well until the central banks came along and decided they'll just print $5 trillion every time some go, something goes wrong so we can never have a recession. But it, uh, my indicators, I, I focus on people, not governments. Governments are the caboose, not the engine of the train. Consumers are 70% of GDP, business capital investment only expands if consumers are expanding and they're the other 10 percent the rest of its government and all they do is react what do they doing now oh we have a recession they react and print money you know uh if they if inflation gets too high they react and, and, and raise interest rates they don't drive the economy and that's why economists can't predict anything so so i just uh started writing my first newsletter in 1989 first book which was was not uh was self-published uh, I was I was lecturing to small business CEOs around the world, and that was my handout. And uh, and then my first book, uh, The Great Boom Ahead, in the early '90s. And and Mark, people think I'm crazy today for saying we're going to see the biggest crash of our lifetime, something like 29 to 32. Back then, I was saying this boom is going to be way greater. Japan's going to collapse. Who was the leader, up and coming leader back then? And, and, and we're going to have the greatest boom in history. And people said, Harry, man, what are you smoking? Well, I was smoking the right stuff. I was looking at demographics <laughs> and generation cycles. And uh, so, you know, that great boom happened and forever since. So I became, you know, I, my first newsletter, 1989, but I basically became an economist right there in the late 80s, early 90s, instead of a business consultant. I switched over and so that's what I do now. And uh, economists still hate me because I don't use any of their knowledge. You know what I mean? Uh, people yeah. say, oh, Harry, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of majoring economics. I'm like, let me give you a couple of books. Don't waste your time. Right. I don't know what they're going to learn because I only had one good course in economics out, out of three. Uh, and, and that was about exactly today, you know, how central banks can expand, well, how the banking system can expand the money supply by lending against 10% reserves, you know, of uh, deposits. So, right. so other than that, I didn't learn anything from that. Yeah. So, so, uh, but I tell you, the economy, my big insight, Mark, I mean, I don't just look at short-term stuff. I have to in my newsletter, which is a hard thing to do because that's less predictable. Long-term trends are a piece of cake. And you know what, you listen to scientists, scientists can predict when the sun's going to burn out in five billion years if you press them, okay? And when the next ice age is gonna hit in 80,000, I mean, long-term things are much easier because there's only a few factors that drive them. If you can identify those, and I found the generations growing up, raising their kids, advancing in their careers, are the number one driver of the economy. And, and the way I learned to predict it was a simple 46-year lag, now it's 47, 
for the peak and spending of the average family. Can you get simpler than that? Take the birth index, adjust the immigrants, which I can do with a computer model, and then just predict forward when they're going to spend the most money, piece of cake. Yeah, that's awesome. So just to give some uh, background and uh, exactly what you're talking about, Harry, um, what you what you write about in your books, and so I have uh, I have them. I've been reading this one since uh, I think I got this one in 2006, um, and these other ones as they've come out. Um, and the big thing that stuck out to me here that was so convincing is exactly what you're talking about, which you look at uh, the economy um, through demographics. And so that's that's what you're saying. You're saying that people are predictable in their spending habits. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, you said something like, you know, in your early 20s, you're buying your first house and you're getting out of college and then 30, you're having your first kid and by 45, you're your peak spending and now you have your bigger house and all those things. And so if you can look at the population, then you can predict where the money is going to be spent. And, and it yeah, made yeah, so boom, much sense. Our economy booms and busts with new generations. We had a 40, 1942 to 68 was an upward boom in stocks and economy of the Bob Hope or World War II generation, some people call it. And then you had a downward time in the 70s with high inflation. Oh, the inflation was coming from young, expensive baby boomers earning the workforce, costing everybody from the government to their parents to businesses to incorporate them. And then when they entered the economy, 1983 to 2007, greatest boom in history. And ever since they stopped spending in 2008, and I call that recession from day one. When the first time I had my spending wave indicator in 1988, it told me 2008 will be when the baby boomers slow down on their spending and we go into an extended downturn. And guess what? We've been living off of quantitative easing printing money to cover it over ever since. Right. So, um, yeah, so like I said, it was so simple and it made so much sense that it was just like, I have to believe in. So, uh, really all of everything I've done is based off of stuff I've learned from you based off these demographics. And, and like, like you said, right, the long term's easy. Um, the question that I have though, is that, you know, you talk about uh, the demographics obviously, but then you use lots of cycles. You yeah. have cycles for everything from four year cycles, presidential cycles, you know, tech, Eight, eight, 90 year cycles. Um, and you go back hundreds of years to look at data and you say these, you know, these 90 year cycles and these 40 year cycles and they converge and all this stuff. Um, the question that I've always had is that um, things just seem to be different today. And how can you go back 300 years ago and use that data for today? And so what I mean by different I believe in the demographic spending and people are predictable in their spending patterns, but really like 1971 going off the gold standard changed the way the whole world works. And now we've printed whatever three, $400 trillion of debt in 50 years, which helped that baby boomer generation explode, helped the housing, helped the autumn, helped all that. Um, and that going forward is probably not going to be the same. So does that affect the way that demographics will spend their money if they don't have money available? And then how could that, how could history uh, rhyme with that little period of time where we had a $400 trillion of debt expansion? Okay. And the answer is yes and no. What I tell people, long-term cycles, generational cycles, and this was documented back hundreds of years by Strauss and Howe in a book called Generations, came out the same time my first, first book did in 1989. Those generate, they quote 40 year generation cycles back in the Bible. So that 40 year rhythm, that is a constant. What happens in each generation cycle, of course it's different when you can drive cars and live in suburbs and have electricity up your door and do all types of things you couldn't in the railroad era or something before that. So I say instead of cycles, think of it like spirals. You get these spirals, you get higher levels because of technological innovation. Urbanization is massive. People living in cities make way more money, have way more job opportunities and specialization and all these sort of things. So there's always progress. The progress is, and this is one of my principles, exponential. There is no linear trend in history. Everything's exponential. So each generation is going to look back at the past and say, well, what was wrong with you retards? You know, I mean, yeah. I and mean, why do old people don't use the internet and Facebook? You know, well, that's what people do. You know, so the generations will come on, but the baby boom was larger than normal. Now, I'll tell you another thing that, that hints at something you were saying that changed a lot. My demographic cycle—that forty-year cycle has always been there. 
it wasn't that important until after World War II. And it was because the last generation, the Bob Folk generation, was the first generation to enter the workforce, again, after World War II, into the 50s and 60s, and be able to afford a home on a 30-year mortgage and have middle class high income. We didn't have a middle class. You know who created the middle class? Henry Ford and a bunch of innovators in the early 1900s. And that finally became easily accessible after World War II. So my demographic indicators would have always been helpful, but they became powerful. I discovered this thing after middle class made demographics more important, that 40 year cycle. And then secondly, just as the baby boom was about to enter the economy and just magnify it. I mean, I saw, I was telling people, this boom is going to the Dow. I said, the Dow is going to hit 10,000 by 2000. This was in 19, late eighties when it was right. two, two, three thousand people hearing, that's not even possible. Right. Well, it happened. I only it hit 12,000, you know? Um, so, so magnitude can change the technologies and, and where we live. I mean, suburbs are different than cities and farms and, 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 uh, and which countries are dominating. I mean, right now the, the Western countries are fading, even the East um, Asian countries, Japan, Taiwan, South Korea, Ta Taiwan and South Korea are peaking here recently. Japan was the first developed country to peak. That's why they had their bubble in stock, their bubble in real estate first, their big crash. You know, my best forecast, I'm not known for this, Mark. My best forecast was in 1989, predicting that Japan was going to collapse for 12 to 14 years and go into deep downturn while the rest of the world, U.S. and Europe that were lagging at the time, would have the greatest boom in history. People looked at me like I was a nut. Right. Because everybody was like, oh, we could just be like Japan, more efficient, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, no. They didn't, they didn't lead any. Did they lead semiconductors or personal computers or internet? No, they were just copycats. So, so what's, what's, uh, the quality what's, may change, but the cycles, 90 years, if you look back, since stock exchanges were created in the late 1700s at a long-term chart, there is one thing that will stand out like the heartbeat on your EKG every second. It's that 90 year cycle you mentioned. Super bubbles, those are every two technology cycles. The technology cycles are 45 years, and that's like a clock. Steamships, railroads, automobiles, jet in transportation. 45 year peak, just like a heartbeat. Yeah. That and and and, and people people decide how fast those new technologies turn in on an S curve of how they adopt them. So the S curve is another prediction tool I use when it comes to new fads new marketing trends, new technologies in our economy. Once it gets between one and 10% adoption, I can calibrate the rest of the S curve and tell you when it's gonna peak. Once countries start to urbanize, I can tell you how rapidly they're urbanizing and how rich they'll be as they get richer living in cities predictably. So I look at the world long-term, like what's not predictable? Most economists say, well, there's not much you can predict past the next election. I'm like, no. I, I don't even know if Trump's going to get reelected or not. He's crazy one day and looks like a genius the next, okay? No, that's hard to predict. Predicting this boom and when it would end in 2007, I did that back in the, in the mid to late 80s, piece of cake. Regardless okay. of political stuff and, and other things that happen, those things are short-term, long-term trends, urbanization of emerging countries, generation spending in fully urban, wealthy, developed countries, are the two most important trends driving our economy. Now, um, a couple of things though. So like things do change though, right? So like uh, you talk about the Bob Hope generation, the baby boom generation and their spending habits were predictable. So like when they got married, when they had kids, that was predictable. But today, especially in, you know, we see in other countries like Japan, China, but even in the US, like people aren't getting married or they're getting w married way later or they're not even having kids or having kids way later. So do you have to start to expand that then or does that all of a sudden throw those cycles completely off? Well, well I get all this data. And now it's not as big as you think. The biggest thing that's happened is that the buying the first home for the baby boomers was 31 on average. It's 34 now for the millennials. That has jumped three years. That's a lot for a demographic category on average. But the peak in spending from the baby boomers to millennials is just one year later, 47 instead of 46. And almost everything except that first home, which is harder to afford now 
and they're more cautious because you got to also remember the millennials saw a real real estate crash, which history is full of. We just didn't see it much after World War II with this huge, you know, mortgage, low cost mortgages and people buying houses, middle class people. Um, but, but uh, you know, those things are the predictable part and they don't change that much. It's 47, back, even when it's 46 US, it was 47 in, in Australia, Japan and Europe, other countries I projected. Just yeah. one year difference. Now, people get married a little later, but they still have kids closer to the same time. A lot of people get married and already pregnant or already have a kid. So it, it's the, the, the biggest thing that drives that cycle is when people have kids. Because once you have kids, you are motivated and you're going to buy a house and you're going to get a car and, da, 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 and you're going to get them into college. Yeah. All those predictable things happen. So, um, so for everyone listening, before we uh, wrap this up, I'm going to ask you to help us figure out where we are and what we're seeing uh, coming up. But before we get to that, so for everyone listening, stick around for that. But I want to dig into these cycles a little bit more. Um, so you're saying that it's moved a little bit, uh, but I would imagine the peak is different. So for example, um, the spending peak at 46, 15 years ago was way higher than the spending peak of 46 might be in 10 years from now right? The amount of money that's being spent. Does that matter? No, no. Actually, the amount of money a little bit higher, but it's true. The millennials have not made as much progress in their standard of living as the baby boomers did over the generation before them. And just, uh, with, the, just with the economy and the amount of debt creation and stuff, there's just more money sloshing around than there might be in the future. Yeah. And, and everybody, every generation, I mean, again, the, the Henry Ford generation before the Bob folk, that drove the Roaring Twenties boom into its peak. Back then, you buy a house, 50% down payment, five-year balloon mortgage. So, so that's why you didn't get a big housing bubble in the Roaring Twenties. You got a big stock bubble. You got a big farm bubble. People were borrowing money to start farms and stuff and buy tractors, which were new horses, you know, mechanical horses. Uh, but you didn't have a big real estate bubble because it was too hard to speculate. So every generation, has been able to borrow more money at lower interest rates as a general rule. And along with technologies, that expands your standard of living and, and how much you earn and spend. It, now, your- one other thing I've seen you talk about with cycles is uh, social unrest. And you've talked about cycles in regards to that as well, right? So obviously we're seeing this happening right now, um, not just in the US, all across the world. Um, is there a cycle lining up right now that you've been looking at in regards to that? Well, well, there is uh, two things. When you get into the winter season, there's four seasons, two booms and two busts over two generations. The winter season, which started in 2008 and will end about 2023, a few years ago, when we see the worst of this crisis I'm talking about, you get more social unrest under that because the economy is the most challenging. But there's also a geopolitical cycle. Now, I had to come up with this one when I made a not so great forecast. It was right about direction, but when the tech wreck crashed and we were coming out of it in late 2002, and I'm saying, oh, here's a buy signal, I thought the Dow was going to be just as strong as it was in the boom before. And it wasn't. Why? 9 11 and terrorism and civil unrest and, and you know, wars around the world just kept expanding and that creates an era of fear which which suppressed stock value it doesn't change the economy so i found there's about a 35 year geopolitical cycle so 40 years boom and bust for the economy about 35 years 17 to 18 years positive like 1982 to 2000 what after the recession of 82 in the in the fall of communism and gorbachev talking to reagan what went wrong? One 100-hour war with Saddam Hussein in that time period, geopolitically. After 9-11, everything's gone wrong. So we've been in a negative geopolitical cycle, and that is bottoming this year. That is one of the things that's going to start to slowly get better. Uh, so that does not affect economic growth, but it, pers- it creates fear in investors, and it means people will pay less for stocks because they're a little more uncertain about those future earnings because, oh, there could be a war or something anytime. Yeah. Um, and, and so that's another cycle that I factor in. But my 40-year boom and bust generation cycle 
in the 45 year technology cycles, which greatly expands productivity and affects where we can live and how we work most important cycles. The geopolitical would be third on that list. So um, you then your social unrest cycle predicts that right sometime in the next couple of years, we'll hopefully turn the table and start to get back to more of a peaceful. This will be more economic downturn than it will be, you know, terrorism and, and Middle East wars and all this stuff. We've seen the worst of that. I think the Iran conflict we've had is probably the, the epitome of that last cycle that started with 9-11. I think that sort of stuff gets better. You notice that the U.S. has no interest in intervening in, in the Middle East now, that we don't need their oil. Well, that's a big deal. Right. We've been the destabilizing factor over there. I mean, they have enough destabilization. All it takes is us infidels entering the picture to right. make it twice as bad. Have you uh, ever heard of a book called Pendulum? I have. And they basically predict 40, a pendulum swinging back 40 years each way, so an 80-year round trip. And it basically says the world goes from a, a me cycle, uh, about me, individualism, decentralization, to a we cycle, which is a centralization or collectivism. Yeah, exactly. And that is the baby boomers versus the Bob Hope generation. Baby boomers are the me generation. Bob Hopers do everything for the good of the country. They're the collective generation. So that is definitely a cycle. And, and uh, Strauss and Howe were the ones to document. They documented that back a couple hundred years. Or even, I think even thousands of years, maybe. They went way back. But right now we are maxing out on the we collectivism, yes. globalism. Yeah. And it, we're re, and you can see the world is rejecting globalism, right? And it's going to start swinging back to decentralization, yeah. Yeah. which I find very interesting. I know you're not a big fan. I am. Uh, we don't have to agree on everything, but um, you know, seeing Bitcoin rise up and really it's the it's techno technology, but it's about decentralization, decentralized government de governance, decentralized you know, what a, everything decentralized. And so right as we're peaking at a centralization cycle and moving back to decentralization, we have this new technology that also enables that. So I think that's going to be pretty interesting. And, and you know who I hate the most? Central banks. They, they, they gum. I have all these natural cycles down cold and they basically just interfere with them. <laughs> I am going to be the happiest person on earth when digital technology, digitization of money and financial assets can allow the economy to expand money supply and grow from the bottoms up organically instead of being manipulated by central banks and governments who wanna play with their currency to help and export and stuff. All of this stuff is cheating and all of it's working against the natural boom and bust. We need bust just like we need sleep to restore and, 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 and get rid of excessive debt and bad companies and stuff and bad loans. We, yeah. This is a natural thing. We need inflation at times and deflation. They all have a role in economic growth. Economists just want 3% growth with 2% with, with inflation. And that's what kills an economy. And guess what? Japan's been in what I call a coma economy since 1990, when they went in their winter season and their bubble burst and decided to just control their economy with constant money printing and, and, and top-down policies. And they'll never come out of this. Never, ever, ever. Okay, so, so I that, can't I, wait for the digital, uh, you know, revolution and Bitcoin. And, and, and so I want to talk about that, um, about Japan. So uh, you mentioned about the central banks. First, I want to just add to a comment. You say like these economists say we can never have these withdrawals, right? We can't have these busts, but we need them. Have a risk. But, but it's the whole <laughs> world. Um, we see today like no one's allowed to be in pain. If you're in pain, take yeah. a pill. Take like a no pill. one's allowed to be sad. Take, if you're sad. If you're not a pill, you're taking her some heroin derivative. Right. You can't, you can't be sad. You can't be unhappy. You can't be, you can't be mad. You can't be in pain. You can't be brought like your, your child can't come in second in the contest at right. school. Everybody's got to be a winner. You know? But, but there's, there's without, without, without the contrast, right. Without sadness, there's no joy. Exactly. Like, without boom, there's no bust, you know, without assholes, there's no good people. Right. How would good people even know they were good if there weren't enough assholes out there to show them, you know? Yeah. The, the play of opposites, Mark, is actually the most central principle of my work. Cycles come from the play of opposites. And, and those cycles create dynamics of boom and bust, inflation and, 
deflation, we and me, all those back and forth things, those are the dynamics that create innovation and growth in long term, more than demographics. It is the technology cycles, how we learn to do things smarter and better and more globally and more urban and all these sort of things that makes us, we are so much richer than people just a hundred years ago. It's embarrassing. If people went back in a time machine, they would shoot themselves. <laughs> they would die of boredom. I was in the hurricane in Puerto Rico for two weeks with no electricity, no TV, no internet, no cell phone even most of the time. Yeah. I was like being, I'm like, oh, this is like the late 1800s. Right. I was ready to jump off the, the <laughs> condo, you know, yeah. balcony. Bored so, to tears. So I want to get back to uh, the central banks and um, them messing everything up. And so- yeah. Um, which the they have. Bank, the, what's that? Which they have, and that'll be obvious in the next few years. Yeah, well, I think it's, yeah, I, I mean, it's obvious to people paying attention. But um, one thing that's interesting, Henry Ford, you talk about Henry Ford, he, he had a quote that said, if people understood how the banking system really worked, there'd be a revolution overnight. And I yeah. think people are waking up to how it works. And I think the internet has ruined their game. The internet has pulled the curtain back and allowed everyone to understand this. And really, I think, again, back to Bitcoin, uh, has made people curious and they've started to like understand what is money and banking. And people are starting to figure this out. And he said there'd be a revolution overnight. And, and a lot of what we're seeing, even like, you know, Iran was having these revolutions and they were burning the banks down. Yeah. And uh, people are re figuring out it's the banks that are causing all this. Um, we could go into a whole thing there. But you said like the banks are uh, uh, messing up these boom and bust cycles. And so that's kind of one thing that I fear and I just want to talk about. So um, you say these cycles are always dependable, but uh, at the same time, the central banks can affect these cycles like they have in Japan, as you made the comment. Yeah. So is it possible that they just go into this uh, coma, you call it like a financial coma or whatever in Japan, and that just becomes the normal? And how long can they keep that up for? A lot of people think Japan's a success. <laughs> They are not as exact. Let me tell you what Japan's like. Young people in Japan don't want to date, don't want to get married, don't want to have sex because they can't afford to make a mistake and have a kid and go broke. That's how bad the economy is. Zero growth since 1997 when their but the, demographic. But the stock market never crashed. <laughs> oh, it did crash. It crashed 70%. It was down 80%. At worst, it's going to be 80 to 90 Real estate in Japan crashed 60% and never, re never re even rebounded when the millennials came along. Right. Japan is in a zero inflation, zero growth. Yes, sometimes they grow a little, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they have a little, play. they're in a coma. But isn't that, what the, isn't, isn't that what the central bankers want? No booms, no busts? They just want it. Flat. Well, no, what they want is... 3% growth and no booms and busts, but there, there they have none because the problem is they don't have any demographics to play on. Uh, and the only solution since, since people don't have kids when they get wealthy is to have immigrants and they don't have immigration. Japanese don't like immigration. So they have a debt economy, but if they'd have let the debt unravel and be restructured and written off a lot of debt, then consumers and businesses would have more purchasing power and the economy would be stronger. You have to constantly, just like a garden, you have to prune the garden to keep it growing and healthy. You got to get rid of zombie banks, bad loans, unproductive businesses. Failure is a part of free market capitalism, taking risk, successes, but then allowing failure to let the crap, the bad businesses get out of the way. If you keep bad businesses, if you keep unproductive, keep paying back, loans that aren't producing anything because they were bad loans in the first place, it's better to write them off, get them out of the way. That's what happens in recession. That's what happens. People have no idea what happens in sleep at night. We still don't, but a lot of stuff happens. We're not wasting time. Right. We're having dreams. Everything in our body's getting re refreshed and restored and cleaned up. Your, your, your brain totally purifies itself only in deep sleep, only in deep sleep. Okay. So, a con recessions are a part and guess what where do as does ever, all the great innovations in history come in downturns not upturns we are at our best when we're challenged so the downturns are challenging and then all those innovations go mainstream and the booms that are more nurturing and easy 
We need both, nurturing and challenge. We need men and women. They're opposites. So back, so back to my question. Well, free market um, capitalism and democracy are two opposites. Democracy is socialism. You really look at it. Yeah. Give everybody a vote. Everybody's equal. That's not, that's not free market capitalism. Right. But so back to the now, question with the central banks messing things up and uh, seeing what's happened in Japan. And like I said, some people think it's a success or whatever, but, uh, but obviously we're going down the same path with QE and unlimited and all this $8 trillion we've spent, et cetera, you know, no end in sight. Um, you know, what does that do to mess up this cycle? I mean, do you think the U S is going to continue just to print, 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 and we end up in this coma, a a Japan like coma? I think what happens is it gets so extreme here because Japan, you got to remember Japan had its bubble and its crisis all by itself. It was 15 years ahead of, of the demographic, trends for, uh, you know, the baby boom for, for uh, Europe and the U.S. and the rest of the developed world. So they got to have that luxury. Everybody's going to go down together. So I think this whole thing collapses. Central bank fail. And people will look at these people like, why did we ever listen to these people? They were, they, every, their solution to every problem was to print money out of thin air and just rain money on something. And how can anybody with any common sense Who's, who's been alive for more than two years, not understand that something, getting something for nothing is not one of God's favorite principles, okay? It's not. Right. And, and, but that's what they do. Something, it's like penicillin. Every, it's, like, it's like taking penicillin every time you had a minor cold. Well, you wouldn't have a digestive system left and a colon if you did that for too many years. That's what right. they're doing. We never get to rebalance. And, and again, first example, Federal Reserve did not exist before 1913, by the way. We didn't have a central bank for many, many decades, which right. shows you don't need one. Right. They're created 1913, 20 years later, greatest bubble, and then greatest depression in history. That was no accident. Right. We would have had that to some degree in the positive cycles anyway. They goosed it up. They constantly stimulate. It means you don't you don't get the stuff out of your economy, so you end up, instead of having a bunch of coals, you end up with pneumonia. Instead of a number of recessions, you end up with a depression. Right. So central banks have done way worse than that this time. Way worse. So when this thing blows, it's just going to be, stocks are going to be down 80 to 90% a few years from now from the top. So let's, so let's talk about that. So you were talking about last year, you were talking about the dark window. Uh, we had, uh, I think it was Dr. Sugar who talks about the melt up, um, same, same basic principles, um, mm-hmm. that basically the fed was going to intervene so much and they were just going to send so much money into the market that things were going to go to this crazy all time high and then it all ends. Um, and I think, again, you use demographics. I think that people are predictable, right? And so I think human nature is predictable. So it makes sense that these guys are going to print until they can't print anymore. Exactly. They're, they're going to go till they blow. Not until they blow. blow. No, notice something. They just printed, literally, since the repo crisis hit. And that was $765 billion they printed in a few months over that. Little repo crisis. That's how bad it says, uh, shaped this banking system. They, since then and now the virus, they have printed $3.4 trillion. And that's not to count the $3 trillion fiscal package and an already $1 trillion a year deficit fiscal stimulus. Okay. But $3.4 trillion, they printed almost as much as in the entire quantitative easing cycle over the last 11 years in just a matter of months. So you see, the more you print, the bigger the financial asset bubbles you create in response to that. And the more you have to print to keep those bubbles from bursting because there's so much wealth now, $400 trillion to be exact in financial assets in the world, and probably been a hundred trillion just decades ago, okay? That collapses, you know, the, the total GDP of the whole world, a little over 80 trillion, okay? That's five times the GDP. If those bubbles just collapse 50%, all those bad bonds and stocks and, 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 and loans, <laughs> yeah, two to three times GDP yeah. disappears. Which is easy to see why the deflation, I mean, you just can't reinflate that balloon. That's what causes deflation. Money disappears, 
less money chasing the but thing. But they're they're preventing they're preventing the loans from going bad, which prevents the deflation from happening. And like and, I said, but to do that, what I'm trying to say, each round they have to print exponentially more. Each round until it gets so ridiculous. And, and again, I think even now the stock market on March 16th, after they came up with their biggest three-day addition of stimulus ever, money printing and um, ledger and fiscal, the stock market went down 15% when the market opened up the next Monday because the stock market said, well, you've been printing money forever and how do we get back in this mess if it works? It's not working anymore. There's a all, point of sudden, all of a sudden it is faith. working. All of a huh? sudden it is all of a sudden it is working, right? We're seeing but that. Now, but it's working today, yeah, but okay. Let's see next year. I'll bet it ain't working next year. That's my bet. Next right, so... Year, so, uh, I mean, there's so many things we could go into. One, one, one comment, I know we could spend a bunch of time talking about this, but obviously you have this whole new breed of politician, you know, the AOC uh, group over there thinking we can just print 70 trillion for this Green New Deal, no big yeah. deal. Um, so you have this MMA. Yeah, yeah. why well, even have the IRS? We'll just print money for all our government spending and then just let it come out in inflation. And, and I think that's... So now, would that pervert the economy or what? That is insanity to say that. It's a good chance we see that. I, I be well, a good chance somebody will try. You know, again, though, what happens when all of a sudden, now, now, quick example again, this little stock crack in five weeks, $20 trillion, I think it's more than that, but that's the best estimate I heard, disappeared in five weeks. $20 trillion is more than all six major central banks printed over the last 11 years. Boom. So all that has to happen is this deleveraging of the giant financial bubble. 400 trillion, five times global GDP, starts to deleverage as it wants to do, and we'll have to do at some point, because you can't be that divorced from reality, just wipes out all this stimulus, and then just, then, then you, then it really doesn't work. So that's the point. There's a point of, that's why I call my last book, Zero Hour. There's a point of diminishing returns where no amount of stimulus works. Right. And so um, I, uh, of course, right. And that's where I'm saying like human nature, they're not going to just wake up tomorrow and go, oh, we should live on a budget. They're going to go till we blow, as you said. Yeah. Um, so you had this theory about this dark hour and they were going to print and it was going to push the market up to crazy all time. Well, it's the final rally in the bubble. The final the rally, the, 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 the put pedal to the metal until the engine blows. Right. Um, it, it's, it's, it's the orgasm in the cycle. It's, it's the final orgasm. And you know what triggered that? And I was right on that one. The repo crisis. They printed $765 billion, more than they had in years of quantitative easing, just to fight that crisis from October into early this year before the virus came and then game over. But yeah. that, that stocks were going up straight with that money printing over the repo crisis. I had a graph showing for every dollar they print repo, stocks go up this much. And, and that, I'm saying we're in the final rally yeah. into early 2020. And I'm going to give uh, give a dark window. And I want to give you prop, props right now. I mean, in this book right here, you were talking about this, this crash and it was a little bit early, but you made it, you made a statement in the book that said the oil market will crash and be the catalyst for the market to drop. And that's exactly what we saw happen. So that was uh, I went back and reread this and that was pretty eerie when I read that. I'm like, dang, he got that one good. Um, so, so you were, you were definitely right about that. But so back to this final orgasm, this dark window, um, it seemed like this, this drop, this 35, 40% drop that we had maybe, uh, kind of defeated that. But now obviously we're ramping back up. We've just seen this, uh, the advanced decline line today got triggered or got triggered what, two days ago, the breath thrust or whatever. Um, looks like the markets are surging. Are we back in that, um, dark window? Are we back into this, uh, orgasm? No, what happened? You got to remember one thing. We had a bubble in the roaring 20s and then a big crash, 90%. And then we had a mini bubble from 32 to 37 with a lot of stimulus. This is more like that, except for shorter term. When a bubble bursts, you get that first 40% crash, give or take, in a couple of months or less, which we've already seen. You get a rebound. Of course, there's going to be government programs and stimulus and all this stuff. And everybody think, and then people are thinking, oh, it's just the virus. And as soon as the virus goes away, we'll be right back to normal. No, you're never back to normal when you overexpand this much and have bubbles this big and debt this high. So um, you get that rally for about four, five, six months. And I say this could last 
into the election, no longer, maybe not that long. And so we're in that rally. It's stronger than normal because they printed so much money. But we're in that, I call a bear market rally. I said in my newsletter in May, early May, I said the NASDAQ, the tech stocks were the only major index, index that did not violate their uptrend in when this bubble crashed. Only when they didn't. So those are likely to make new highs, but the S&P and all those will come close, but not. So, so that's what, one of the things I'm looking for, Mark, over now and over the next few months. And I think we're getting ready to take a correction now, see one more thrust up in, in towards the election. But we see the NASDAQ making new highs, but the S&P and the Russell 2000 small caps and the transportation and the Dow, they can't quite make a new high. That's a classic divergence that says, okay, now we're going into the bigger wave down. And again, the tech bubble from 2000, 2002, took almost three years, 40% crash, rebound for several months, and then two, a little over two year grueling downturn. 1929, 40% crash, five to six month rally, a little over two year grueling downturn and deleveraging. So we're in that bounce and those are strong bounces strong bounce bear market rally before say just before or just after election it just seems usually we have like a 50 percent retrace and we've gone way over that so that's yeah. why i was curious 50 to 60 percent is typical this one's gone bananas yeah it's, it's going to be like more like 70 to 80 percent. but you got to realize they just cope between fiscal stimulus and monetary stimulus in just a matter of months Six trillion dollars. Thirty percent of our GDP was put in, and there could so be another. There could be another ten trillion behind be it. Able to get ten percent growth a year for forty years out of that. Well, we're not going to get that. Right, but there could be another ten trillion behind it. They could be twenty, oh, yeah. thirty trillion. Oh, hey, hey, they'll. Well, well, now that we got a bounce, that'll take a little steam off of that. Yeah. But, but yeah, I mean, just this amount of stimulus is enough reason that the markets are going to have more than the normal 50 to 60 percent. So like I still uh, in, say, in December, don't was get it back to normal. Too many small businesses that most people don't see and didn't get all these loans from the governments and support, you know, they just don't come back. And it was just like the hurricane in Puerto Rico. 20 percent of the restaurants within a block and a half of me never came back after that hurricane. Never. Got it. So um, the dark window is closing. We maybe continue to rally to the election and then probably a couple at the, years. At the latest, yeah. And I don't know if it'll even make it that long since it's gone so hard, but yes. I, I say, and, and normally that, that bear market rally is a wave up, a correction against it. And this should be a, a good, I think we got a good correction coming. And then we see one more rally and maybe one more stimulus program from the government. And that rally goes into August, September, October, some of that time frame. And that's when I say, run, get out, do not listen to economists, do not listen to your financial advisor. They're right 80, 90% of the time, but you do not sit through a, a great reset like this, like 29 to 32, or even in the tech stock, 2000, 2002. You don't sit, you don't sit through a 70, 80, 90% stock correction or a 40 to 50% real estate. And that's what I'm saying for real estate. It's 34% last time, it's gonna be 40 to 50% this last this time with more foreclosure. So we'll, uh, we'll wrap it up. I know we're getting late on time, but I wanna ask then, uh, you said to run. Where do we run, where do we run to? Well, we were, just, we were just, it's what I said with one exception. You go into the highest quality bonds, which are the 10 and 30 year treasury bonds. They that are have, not going to default. No, that have and, no return? And, and they like, one thing that likes deflation is interest rates go down. You buy a bond when interest rates are 2% and they go to zero, you make money in addition to the interest. Your, your bond goes up in value. Everything else doesn't. Junk bonds do bad. Even, now what, what happened here, the one exception, I said AAA corporate bonds and treasuries are the best place to run. Well, the treasuries did great. They were up 24% at best when stocks were down. 35 to 44%, okay? Beautiful. AAA core or, or the investment grade corporate went up at first and then they went down because this virus hit major industries so hard that every, every bond becomes a junk bond when, you're, when your sales are down 50 to 80%. Right. If you're a cruise ship, an airline or a hotel chain or a big retail chain. So that was the one 
exception. Cash does well. Gold does okay. It goes up at the first of crisis. Then when it sees deflation and downturn, it goes down. And that's what it did. Gold was down about 9 or 10%. But hey, that's better than stocks. 40, basically. And guess what? And I say this. I love cryptocurrency. Love them, love them, love them. They're the next internet, the digitization of all financial assets. Big deal. But they're in the hype phase, and they're going to crash one more time big. And as, as I said, guess what did worse of the safe haven? Bitcoin, down 45%. The worst of all, and, but it but comes back strongest in the recovery. But it didn't need stock market circuit breakers. It didn't need stimulus. It didn't need any of that, and it bounced back all on its own. And it bounced back strong. I'm, I'm telling you, the number two things to buy in, in in investment outside of real estate when this crash is over, and I'm predicting, and, and I said this 20 some years ago, and that's part of my cycle: 40 year, 20 year, and 90 year coming together in late 2022. Around there, when we see the biggest crash, number one thing to buy is the surviving cryptocurrency blockchain companies, like buying Amazon in 2001 or two when it went from six to 136, back down to six, and now it's at 2,500, okay? That's gonna be the best tech sector coming out of this. It is the next big thing. It is the internet, a financial asset, which is huge. And the part of the world that's going to boom the most will not be China this time. They already did it and overdid it. It will be India and Southeast Asia will be the strongest urbanization productivity trend in the world. Africa may have the most demographic growth, but it's still going to be low income for a while. So Southeast Asia and India, I want to buy in stocks and I want to buy the best surviving if Bitcoin still around and Ethereum or whoever, whoever still standing in 2022 load up on them and they could be bitcoin could be back down closer to a thousand that's when you load up the boat if it gets that low. and you also said real estate real estate is not the same real estate aging is the enemy of real estate almost all real estates fall between 27 when people move out of apartments into their peak home buying at 42 ahead of their peak spend and and the second thing happens old people since housing real estate last forever unlike clothes or cars or other things we buy durable goods you don't need a new home old people dying is bad for real estate well baby boomers are dying into 2039 real estate will never bubble like this again never grow like this millennials may be buying but they can be offset by the selling of baby boomers for the rest so so i'm yeah i buy real estate when it's down but i don't think you're not going to see a boom in real estate, anything like this. What I, what, what I want to buy? Infrastructure in Southeast Asia and India. That's the real estate I would buy. Got it. Okay. Well, um, that is a great place to end it because you've given us what to look forward to into 2022 over the next couple of years. So, um, man, I appreciate you taking the time to uh, give us all that information. And uh, it's been great. Thanks so much. And, and, and real quick, man, we have a free newsletter, harrygent.com. Way yeah. to get the notes. Everything I do is different from economists. So I just say, look, just listen to us. If you don't think we know what we're talking about after getting our free newsletter for six months, then get off. But I think you'll find out we can explain a lot of things that most people can't. And I'm telling you, nobody's going to predict this scenario. To me, this scenario is already baked in the cake. This yeah. crash, this rebound, and then a deeper downturn into 2022 already baked in the cake. Yeah, I recommend everyone go to uh, Harry's, harrydent.com and get that newsletter. I'll link to it in the description here. Um, you know, I, I do. <laughs> I, I, I read and I subscribe. So uh, it, it's, it's really been helpful for me. I recommend everyone to go do that. Um, so uh, yeah, Harry, thanks so much for jumping on. Thank you, Mark.